I would like to bring forth our first presenter, Tom Dyson, a torch box, who will be talking about the state of Wechtel 2022. There's nothing really groundbreaking in this book. Has anyone seen it? Has anyone enjoyed it? It's, uh, it's written in a slightly annoying style, like most American <coughs> business books. There are a few ways that it's helped us become a more effective organization. One of those is around metrics. The author tells us to imagine you're on a desert island somewhere. All you have is a piece of paper with a handful of numbers on it. These numbers must allow you to have an absolute pulse in your business. What are all of the numbers that should be on that piece of paper? For business, these numbers could be incoming leads, or client satisfaction, or staff happiness. For an open source project, the metrics aren't so good. One metric we've used is GitHub stars. The last time I gave this talk in person, we were celebrating 7,000 stars. And today, I'm happy that we've, we've almost doubled that. But is this growth fast enough? Do GitHub stars even matter? It's hard to know, but the fact that they're increasing and at a faster rate than before is comforting. And GitHub stars are definitely a factor that people who choose technologies take into account. But it's not the only metric that we track. <coughs> I'm afraid this, this, these numbers on this might be too small for some of you at the back, but I'll, I'll read out some. The Wagtail core team agreed to focus on the following numbers. New issues, closed issues, opened and merged pull requests, contributors, and star count. Every week, the core team meets, and we have a fixed agenda item to review these numbers. We have a semi-automated process that extracts them from GitHub, but then requires someone to paste them in. Actually, I think that manual part is quite useful, because it, uh, at, the, at, the moment, at the point of putting them in, and think about the numbers and, and what they might mean. I'm really pleased that we have these metrics, but I'm not sure that they're always the right ones or that we're dealing with them in the right way. Obviously, more GitHub stars is better than fewer GitHub stars. But what about pull requests? Do we want pull requests to go up or down? As with most statistics, you can spin them both ways. We could feel like our high number of pull requests mean that we have an engaged, enthusiastic community constantly contributing stuff, or we could feel like we're not putting enough effort into maintenance and supporting the people who are submitting the pull requests. Similarly with our issues, our issue count is, is slowly growing. Please bear with us. And we celebrate that because it means we have lots of eyes on the different edge cases, the different things that can go wrong in software, or do we, do we worry about it because it means we've got buggy code? Carl has been uh, doing some interesting work on this, pulling all the GitHub stats into a big database, which is going to allow us to build more sophisticated and useful queries. For example, what's the average time between pull request submission and first response? Or more precisely, has anyone waited longer than a certain number of days or weeks for a response to their pull request? I know how this feels on the other side. I've often submitted small pull requests to other repos, sometimes just typos on the readme, and sometimes those PRs are ignored. Of course, that's fine. They don't, they, they don't owe me any attention. But when other open source maintainers respond quickly and with a friendly message, I feel very motivated to continue contributing. I think we're doing an okay job here, but I don't think we're always doing a brilliant job. Another one is the average response time for support questions. And for support, we use mainly Slack and Stack Overflow. This is a harder one to measure, but I think we could find a way of doing it through scraping and API access. My impression is that the Wagtail community is pretty strong. There are a handful of people, and some of them are in this room, who do an amazing job of supporting people on Slack and Stack Overflow. But again, it would be good to set a target for the average and maximum response times and keep finding ways of bringing these numbers down. <coughs> but the metric that I think is completely uncontroversial is the number of contributors. 
last year we set ourselves a target of 500 contributors before the start of 2022, and I'm happy to say that we, we hit that target a few months early. But if we look again at the figures, you will see that our growth is pretty minimal here. So this is showing the weeks that have gone back, the last 20 or so weeks, and most weeks we gain between naught and three new contributors. Every now and then, like halfway along in 6th of April, we had a spike, we had eight new contributors one week, uh, and I hope we'll see another one after the, the sprint that we've had in the last few days. But then it's settled down again. For me, this is the most important metric because it shows the health of the community and also because a larger number of contributors should lead to more rapid improvements. So, how can we gain more new contributors? This is a question that we ask ourselves in the Wi-Fi 14. I'm sure all open source projects think about the same question. In our team, we've come up with four main answers to this. First is triaging. So this is the, uh, the initial work that, that happens when a, when a pull request or, or an issue comes in. And uh, it's, it's often quite a, simple, uh, quite a simple task of identifying what sort of issue this is and whether or not it's something that could be easily handled by, by a first-time contributor. Often it's tempting for the more expert developers to just deal with these issues. But Increasingly, we're, uh, we're asking ourselves to, to resist handling the easy things and instead tag them as good first issues and perhaps provide a description uh, that will help someone who's coming into the community to tackle them. The second is sprints. So for the last few days here in Ireland, there have been a group of people working on, uh, working on white tail issues and, and, and PRs in a concentrated and accelerated way. And similarly with these sprints, uh, it's, it's tempting for people to, uh, for, the, for, the, for the experts to work on solving these problems, but increasingly we're trying to focus on helping new people in the community get over the hurdles of creating core requests, sometimes to their, their very first core requests. The third one is around developer environments. Finding ways to simplify the setup, so getting to that, that allowing people to, to start solving the problem once they've done the boring tasks of, uh, of creating their, their local environment. I think we've done some good work here. Um, for example, we have the, uh, the, the Docker environment, Wagtail, Docker Wagtail Develop, maybe some of you have experienced that, that was created at a previous sprint. Um, or the one-click GitPod setup, which I particularly like, so this, is, this creates a complete developer environment for Wagtail in your browser, in your cloud. And, uh, and Boone has been, been working very well on this. And the last one of our list are, is uh, investing in programs like Google Summer Code, which we'll talk about later, and others. There are, there, are, there are similar projects. Outreach is one that we're interested in. And this is about creating, uh, increasing the, the diversity of the, the contributors that we have in our, in our pool at the moment and uh, expanding it internationally. Before I leave the subject of metrics, I want to address the question of accountability. <coughs> this is one way that open source projects are very different to commercial environments. Our community is made up mainly of volunteers, some of whom are supported by their employers, but most of whom work on Wagtail at least partly in their own time. This might be because they, they find it enjoyable, or because it's an uh, interesting technical challenge, or because they want to build their skills. But generally, it's for altruistic reasons. As a group of volunteers, we can assign actions to each other, and sometimes we might. For example, in, the, in our Wagtail quarterly meeting, we might say, everybody in the team should triage three actions before the next meeting. But if people don't carry out those actions, there aren't any consequences for them. Of course, this is the same problem that all voluntary organizations face. In general, there's enough goodwill and energy to keep things moving. But I think the, the lack of accountability in, in open source and in voluntary organisations is one of the reasons that big open source projects like Wagtail need commercial sponsors to succeed, to provide a kind of background of that accountability. Luckily, Wagtail has many examples of this. There are lots of different ways that organisations can spend money on open source, 
with results that are mutually beneficial and which can help to create accountability. Again, some of the organizations on this list are represented in this room. Uh, Torchbox, the, the, the company that some of us here work for that, that creates Whitetail and is investing more and more. I think we've doubled or even trebled our investment in Whitetail in the last year. Uh, companies like Four Digits, Fabric, Lab Digital, Hypeza, Overcast, who sponsor or run conferences like this and who uh, give some of their time to employees to work on the, the products which in turn are useful for their clients. And at the bottom of the list, people like Mozilla and Google and Motley Fool and YouGov who directly sponsor features, which, uh, which is, you know, I think, kind of progressive and generous, but also makes good sense for them because uh, because Whitetail is a very important tool for, for the big websites that they build and it's in their interest to continue improving. We need to keep building these sort of commercial relationships, but it's not a task that I think many open source developers would relish. I think it's an important part, nevertheless, of creating a sustainable community. And then the flip side of accountability is burnout. This is something that we hear more and more about in the open source community. Contributors who have given many lives, many years of their lives to projects but then give up in exhaustion. Sometimes because of rude people criticizing decisions or demanding changes for their very specific use cases. Thankfully, we haven't seen much of this in the micro. Uh, White Club doesn't seem to suffer as much from angry, entitled people as many other open source projects. And maybe you're, maybe you're telling me I'm wrong and you've, you've, you've experienced this, but I'm, I'm grateful that I haven't really. I don't know really why this is, other than that Python and Django seem to attract kind and sensible people. But I do think that it's important, it's important that as Wagtail grows, potentially outside the, the, the Django and Python communities, that we maintain a culture of positivity and support. Okay, that was the, the big picture stuff. Uh, next, uh, for the, for the, uh, next, I want to cover six headlines from the Wagtail project from the last year. And there are lots more than I could have chosen from, and I'm sorry if I haven't picked your top six, but uh, these are the ones that felt most significant to me. The first is Wagtail 3, big release for us uh, for, for many reasons. One, well, maybe the two, two of the top things that, that many of you will have noticed will be uh, the numbering change. So we have adopted semantic versioning. Um, this means that uh, we are we're going to use the big number for, for, for big releases, particularly that have um, backwards incompatibility uh, constraints, um, or that have significant editor and UI changes. Um, and this does put us in a slightly strange position that uh, having gone four years between Wagtail 2 and Wagtail 3, we're actually going to go from Wagtail 3.0 to Wagtail 4.0 in three months, because uh, the next release is also going to have some significant UI changes. But um, as, as Matthew said when he was uh, outlining his case for making the switch to semantic versioning, this sort of uh, weirdness is, is, uh, is kind of what you have to, what, it's, it's, it's a weirdness that you have to adopt if you're willing to adopt the semantic version. Um, and the next is that things look different. So we, we've got some new colors. We have, uh, some of you may, may feel a bit sad to see the, uh, oh, the, the, the white tails green disappear and, and be gradually replaced, but um, uh, we're confident that it's, uh, it's a kind of set fresh air, yeah, more modern and more accessible look. And then there are cool features like a, like a splitter, the text splitter, which was actually a uh, proof of concept of this at a previous Wagtail space, and now it's in Wagtail 3. And uh, image duplicates, um, just kind of gradually chipping off the, the, the subtle annoyances that uh, editors might face. So Wagtail 3 did release something for us to be proud of in the last year. Another one is that we now have a full-time community manager, and um, I'm sorry she's not she's not here today. Um, this is Megan Voss. She's based in the U.S. Um, she is uh, um, a writer and an educator, and um, she we, we became aware of Megan when she started asking really interesting questions on Whitetail Slack, having built her own site on Whitetail, um, and we were I guess a bit inspired by. To, for this role by uh, Divio and uh, Daniela, who, who, Daniela Fushida, who has um, been at many of these events and did an amazing job as community manager for Divio and Django CMS. And um, 
And I think it's a, it's an important move and quite a big step for us to have someone who's who's going to be full time thinking about how to grow and support our community. And uh, uh, I'm sure you'll be we'll be hearing a lot more from Megan in the next year. The next is Google Summer of Code. So. Uh, I guess most of you are familiar with this project. It's something that's been running for uh, 10 or 15 years. Google give money to students from around the world to work on open source. And um, it's, it's not a huge sum of money, but it's a, it's, it's a meaningful amount. And, uh, and it's becoming a really important way of getting people into open source. Last year, we had a lot of success with this. We went under the umbrella of the Django project, and uh, we had we, we had three projects. In fact, Google awarded us two, and then we, we sponsored the third one. And those projects were really successful. And um, we had uh, Tibian and Shohan and Aldan, who, who all worked on really interesting features. Um, Tibian and Aldan both gave, gave talks at PyCon US, and they, they, their talks were in, the, in some, some of the most watched talks at, at that conference. Tibian's now working full time on Django. Um, Shohan is continuing to develop cool features. It's, uh, it's you know, the, the process of, of, of mentoring these people is really rewarding, but then, but then seeing the outcomes is, is even more exciting. So this year, uh, we've gone a step further. We, we're no longer going under the Django umbrella. Wagtail submitted as its own project to Google Summer of Code, and we had an amazing amount of interest from, from candidates. Uh, we submitted, I think, six, and we were rewarded three. So three projects with mentors and sub-mentors and, and applicants. And uh, there was one other that we just felt we, we, we were so excited by the project that we wanted to sponsor it as well. So Dualtrox is, is paying the same stipend that, that Google would, uh, but, it, but it's going through otherwise exactly the same process with, with mentors in, in the same process. So uh, we're going to have, by the end of this, uh, Windows High Contrast support. So this is a big step for, for the continuing focus on accessibility in Wagtail. Um, we're going to move the editor's guide out from its section into the docs into a standalone project. So um, creating a really rich and useful document for, uh, for, your, for your clients, hopefully, but for the editors. Um, this, a, a, really, a gnarly one is the, the toolkit for, for stream field data migration. So you, you might have experienced this already, the work that you have to do, if you're, especially if you're taking content from kind of more traditional structured data into stream field. And then finally, uh, a, a, a thorough unification of the UX. So we're going to start on this, and we're going to deliver this through the whole of Python. So this is it's Google Summer of Code. Summer is a is a bit of a, a tr tricky word because actually for, for many of the participants, it's, it's not summer, but it's uh, it's a European summer. It's starting starting soon, and uh, you'll be seeing a lot of the output of this soon. Okay, I'm near the near the end of my list. Um, uh, we, have, we, we created a, a vision for Wagtail, and hopefully some of you saw this. We presented it at uh, one of our uh, What's New in Wagtail webinars. Um, I won't go through it all now, but um, uh, going through this, the process of creating vision is, is really interesting and, and challenging, and it's hard to, to focus on a few things and then to express them in simple terms, but I think we, we found that process really valuable, and we've come up with a document which I feel stands up well. It's, it's just a one-year vision because uh, because it's hard to think five years ahead in, in, in technologies like this. But I really encourage you, if you haven't seen it all already, to, to look at it. Here's the URL. It's in a sort of cartoon style. And, um, and we've had some events in the last six years as well. So in the last year, I mean. Um, uh, we had, uh, there was a, an in-person event in, in Cleveland for, for the Wagtail Space US. Uh, PyCon was, we were, was, Wagtail was very highly represented. We're all here now at Wagtail Space in the Netherlands, and we've got DjangoCon coming up. And um, you know, a year ago, it was kind of hard to imagine that this would be happening again. And I think a uh, fantastic that there's some real life events happening again, and Wagtail is very well represented. And finally on my list is uh, Wagtail Builder, uh, which is um, a project that we've been working on at Torchbox, and uh, which I'm very excited about, but I'm not going to say any more about because it will spoil uh, talk just about to happen. But it is, in my opinion, one of the uh, one of the big pieces of news in my shop. Right, and after all that, I'm going to end on uh, maybe a slightly gloomy question: um, Will Wagtail die? I think it's uh, uh, I think it's important to acknowledge that technology moves on. I guess I am one of the um, the oldest person here, or certainly in the top few. And so I've seen the, the birth and death of a few different technologies, and I'm sure many of you have too. 
uh, George Box, the first dynamic stuff we were building was, was, was on Perl, then we really got into Cold Fusion, um, and then in uh, late 2000s, George Box adopted Drupal, uh, which was a really you know, successful CMS, thriving open source community, especially big in the nonprofit sector, the, the way we're focused. And uh, it was very good for Torchbox commercially to become a sort of leading Drupal agency. Um, similarly, Four Digits, our hosts, were really big in the Plum community. And I think some of the ways that they've, they've learned how to run events like this and to be such kind of excellent uh, open source participants was through their, through their involvement in the Plum community. And, but in many cases, those, those, those technologies, I mean, it's not not true to say they've died, but clearly they're not. Uh, then they're on the way. And there, there was a, there was a, a phrase in, in Drupal. It might even be like a, a subheading, like a like a slogan, which was "Come for the software and stay for the community." Which is a nice it's a nice idea, and uh, and it's and it's something that, that resonates. But I think it's a dangerous idea, and it's uh, it's not one that I'd, I'd like to promote for Wagtail, because I think that if we were all coming to Arnhem, if we were coming to Arnhem again in ten years' time. It shouldn't be because you're all lovely and because Four Digits puts on a big party. It should be because Wagtail is still the best tool for us to build websites for our clients. And so then to help ensure that Wagtail is still the best tool, we should ask a different question. Not will Wagtail die, but why might Wagtail die? Here are some, some ideas I've got, some, some reasons that you could give that, that Wagtail might die. One is that Python could lose favor. So uh, this is something Python's really helped us. You know, in, when, when we launched Wagtail 2014, 2015, Python was relatively niche and then you know it's exploded since then because of dead science and machine learning and, and because people just recognize it's a great language. Um, but it's possible that uh, Python itself will be supplanted by cooler, newer, faster languages. Django could stall. So, um, Maybe there's already a sense that, that the, the development of Django itself has, uh, has decelerated. There aren't as many exciting ideas in Django. It could be that everyone moves to hosted services in the same way that probably many of you don't run your own email servers anymore, but you use Gmail or Office for your organization. Similarly, people will feel like they don't be want to be running web servers for their, for their website. Or it could be the websites themselves die, that um, just, just like people, like people are rarely run their own blogs now, they just tweet or Instagram or, or, or use Medium. The same thing could happen for, for Google or Google. Um, so those are, those are some reasons. I don't really believe in any of those. Uh, I don't think Python will lose favor, at least, at least not for the next 10 years. Um, I think it is possibly true. My take on that is that Jagger has really solved most of the important problems that it set out to solve. and. And that could just be a good thing. I mean, it's it's a, it's, a, it's what some, what you might describe boring but stable technology. And I think that actually there'll be a move against some of these hosted services uh, as people become more conscious of, uh, of privacy and, and data ownership. And I think actually here in in, in mainland Europe, you will be ahead of us in the UK and the US on this. And I don't really, but I think I I, I can't see websites disappearing. And in fact, again, there seems to be perhaps in some cases a move back to traditional websites. I'm not denying that any of these things could happen, but I, I don't really believe in them. I, I guess the, the, the reasons that, that a technology die are probably hard to predict. But the one that I think is, is most likely is that something simpler will come along. And, and I guess and one of the reasons I think this is thinking back to when Wagtail came out. When Wagtail came out, there already was an established, successful Django CMS called Django CMS. And uh, it had many features, it had uh, a lot of users, a lot of contributors. And, um, and Wagtail actually uh, you know, didn't have many of the things that Django CMS had. When Wagtail came out, it didn't have Streamfield, um, it didn't have uh, internationalization, it didn't have an API. And I think one of the things that appealed to people with, with Wagtail was that it just felt lighter and fresher and easier to get into. And, and especially as a, as a Django developer, it felt, like, it felt more natural. I don't, I don't you know, I'm speaking for everybody else, but uh, that, that, that's my impression for the reason it was adopted. Despite that, and and although now as Wagtail we might feel that we sort of created this big moat around us because we have so much attention to detail. I mean, when I when I think about some of the PRs coming in now around something was around yesterday around accessibility on tooltips on on relative dates, 
Now, these are not problems that you think about when, you, when you're creating a new CMS, but they are important problems, that, and it's because it's this then endless feeling of like chipping away and making things better. And when you do all that work, you think, how can anyone compete with this? Because, uh, because you know, it's going to take them years to get to the stage where they're worrying about accessible toolkits on the middle of the day. But the reality is that people are always attracted to things that are simpler and easier to use. And, and I guess that's where I want to end, is that as well as all the interesting work we're doing on building new features and growing our community and, uh, and, and finding new ways to build cool websites with Wagtail, that we continue to focus as features, well on, on simplicity and speed and, speed and, and, uh, and the, uh, the joy of, of first experience. That's it for me. Thank you very much.